Hello and welcome to this video overview in which I, Don Lucas, discuss some of the most important concepts from Chapter 7, Grammar, History, and Background, in my textbook, College Composition and Reading, Information and Strategies. Hopefully, knowing a little about why our grammar system is so crazy, as well as getting a little insight into how much you already know, can make grammar a bit less scary. The first thing that I want to address in our discussion about grammar is the fear and hatred that it so often inspires, often due to overly enthusiastic teachers with red pens. Too many students have spent years being told the way they speak and write is incorrect and yet the actual rules they're supposed to be applied too often seem to not make any sense and to be totally arbitrary. People who have a hard time writing using correct grammar are often made to feel inferior or ashamed of themselves. I find this unconscionable, so I'm going to teach you some of the real history and background about where standard English grammar came from to hopefully make using it seem less intimidating and value-laden. Even I, an English teacher, who's always had a good instinctive grasp of grammar due to the amount of reading I do, ended high school and even college hating grammar, being intimidated by it, and feeling like I didn't have as solid of an understanding of it as I should. This is a common feeling. I would guess that most people do not consider themselves experts on grammar. But the fact is, Everyone has an excellent grasp of the underlying syntax and grammatical idiosyncrasies of their own native language. However, a language isn't really one thing, so your native language may be a dialect of English different than the prestige dialect, standard English, which is more formal and restricted than most. However, that doesn't mean that there is something inherently better about standard English than the way that we speak with our friends. That's just the dialect that happened to get lucky. You know it wasn't a logical decision when you see how many of the rules make no sense. These truths will be the focus for this PowerPoint, and we'll come back to each to discuss it in detail. For now, let's talk about the first topic on the list. The fact that everyone is an expert in the underlying syntax and grammatical idiosyncrasies of their own native language. We all know much more about the difficult and complicated grammar of our own language than we often realize or give ourselves credit for. Let's look at some examples that demonstrate this. Just because you might not know the label doesn't mean that you don't know the concept or how to use it. This chart looks horribly intimidating and complicated, but you already know even more than what appears here. One thing that we're almost never taught, and yet usually know, is the difference between a mass noun and a count noun. As the names might indicate, count nouns are things you can count. Tables, dogs, parks. Mass nouns, on the other hand, are something that is treated as a collection and cannot be counted, like happiness or furniture, or that can only be counted once you break it into units. For instance, you can't count water, but you can count drops of water or gallons of water. This is something we usually don't think about, but it affects the grammar of the sentence in ways every native speaker knows unconsciously. You cannot make a mass noun plural, and you wouldn't, even if you've never heard of this rule. For example, if you're a native speaker of English, you would never say, The truck came today and collected all the garbages. You know that it has to be collected the garbage, no matter how many garbage cans got picked up. Garbage is a mass noun, and garbage cans are a count noun. Despite the fact that many people have never heard of these labels, they know you can't say, you have very nice furnitures, or I like those seven chair. They know it has to be, you have very nice furniture, or I like those seven chairs. This is even more impressive because the guidelines on what makes a mass or count noun are not always clear. There are some general guidelines. For example, most nouns referring to liquids milk, wine, water, powders, sugar, sand, or substances, plastic, steel, are mass nouns. But a lot of them don't seem to follow any logic. For instance, vegetables are a count noun, but fruit 
isn't. So you say, I like fruit, not fruits, despite the fact that fruit and vegetables seem like they would be in the same category. And even though vegetables are a count noun, corn, a vegetable, isn't. You can't have a serving of corns at Thanksgiving. Another aspect of mass and count nouns is that they determine whether you say many for a count noun or much for a mass noun. You would ask how much water, because water is a mass noun, but how many rugs, since they are a count noun. In the same way, fewer is for count nouns and less is for mass nouns. You would have less milk, but fewer glasses to put it in. And yet, even if you've never heard of this distinction and never thought about it, you would never accidentally say, how many monies do you have? Any native speaker knows the phrase is, how much money do you have, even if they can't explain that it's because money is a mass noun. It's part of the English grammar system that any native speaker absorbs while learning to speak the language. Despite the fact that you have likely never been taught it in school, and despite the fact that it is really unintuitive, you still know how to use mass nouns and count nouns. And this is just one of the many specific grammatical rules that you know without being aware of it. So like I said, this chart of grammar knowledge related to verbs looks overwhelming, but if we zoom in on one section, you can see that it is merely a representation of what you already know, even if unconsciously. Let's take a look. If we zoom in on the branch titled Tense, you can see that it splits into three possibilities, past tense, present tense, and future tense. The hourglass behind the line indicates that tense has to do with time, and each of the three tenses is illustrated. He ran to school, he runs to school, he will run to school. Like I said, you even know more than what's represented here, since you can also say things like, he is running to school, and he had run to school earlier, which are more complicated tenses. Again, this chart looks overwhelming, but falls short at recording what you already know, even though you probably never considered grammar your strength. So then, you know a lot more than you give yourself credit for. We have all these categories we can manipulate without even thinking about, it, and that is something to be proud of. Another misconception I'd like to clear up is about people who think they speak incorrectly. It may surprise you to learn that the common belief that we often speak incorrectly or make grammatical mistakes in our everyday verbal connection isn't true. Humans are genetically programmed to speak their native language, and as a result, people don't actually make mistakes that violate the underlying syntactic rules of the language. For example, no native speaker accidentally says, I saw friend my, instead of, I saw my friend. You are an expert in your own native language, and the way you speak it follows the rules, even if those rules differ from the ones used by the standard English dialect. So, as I said, everyone is an expert in the underlying syntax and grammatical idiosyncrasies of their own native language. However, that doesn't mean that you're automatically an expert in all dialects of your native language. In fact, the vast majority of people struggle with at least parts of the grammar that it's taught in school. This is due to the fact that English is not just a single language. Different people speak it differently according to location, culture, and more. Nonetheless, the academic and professional communities say that written language should follow the conventions of standard English dialect, even though it isn't actually spoken anywhere. Spoken dialects vary widely from region to region and even group to group in the same region, while standard English is the standard in the entire U.S. and even, to a large extent, Britain and the rest of the world. There are advantages to learning standard English, which we'll discuss, but it's important to realize that it is an artificial language. No one speaks standard English natively. One reason that academic writing often differs from how we speak naturally is the fact that different regions and cultures have slightly different ways of communicating. Linguist John McHorter says that, quote, what we call a language is really a bundle of dialects, end quote. 
Think about it. People in the South have one accent and say y'all, and people in upstate New York have another accent and call fireflies lightning bugs. Whether you refer to a certain type of sandwich as a hoagie or a sub-sandwich depends on where you live. There are even dialects that are more about the ethnic communities than location, the most famous of which is Black English, sometimes called Ebonics or African American Vernacular, which has different rules for conjugating verbs and often omits to-be verbs in phrases like she a cheerleader rather than she is a cheerleader, as well as differences in word use like the use of up in she all up in my house. These are not mistakes. They are simply dialects with different rules, but those rules are still being followed. Again, any language, English included, isn't really a language. It's a bundle of dialects, which in combination constitute what the language is and how it's used. Dialects are variations on a theme, and none is intrinsically better or worse. Each is correct in the discourse community that uses it, and odd in the ones that don't. Let's look at some more examples from here in the U.S. about how, even today with mass media, regional differences still exist, even though everyone is speaking English. Here's an illustrated example of the way that language can change over distance. The word you use in general to mean soft drinks changes depending on where you live, even though we're all speaking English. As you can see, there's quite a bit of variation, and that's just for one commonly used word in one country where national radio, television, and internet means that regional variations are a lot less pronounced than they were a couple of hundred years ago. And yet, you can see in the red area, people call it soda, in the blue area, people call it pop. In the green area, people call it Coke, regardless of what type of soda they're drinking. And in the yellow part, which you can barely even see, people call them soft drinks. And this next slide actually shows that the previous one is really simplified. There is a lot going on with what people call their beverages. Keep in mind that all these charts have this kind of data behind them. Nor is what to call sodas the only drink-related controversy. Something as simple as the thing you drink out of in the hall at schools can be a water fountain, red, a drinking fountain, blue, or a bubbler, green, depending on where you live. Speaking of water, what do you call those little mini lobster things that you find in ponds, streams, and lakes? I'm used to calling them crawdads, and I live in the green area, which includes Northern California. People in the red areas call them crawfish, while people in the blue areas call them crayfish. Marked in yellow are people who have no special word for that animal. What do you call the traffic situation where you have to go in a circle to navigate an intersection? Well, people marked in red call it a traffic circle. People marked in blue call it a roundabout. Marked in green have no word for this. And marked in yellow call it a rotary. Another example that illustrates how location can affect what words mean, when you hear someone mention the city, what city do you think they're talking about? Well, it depends on where you live. You can see that the people who live near New York City are the most likely, marked in red, to think of that as the city, with many other people in the country thinking the same, marked in green and yellow, for about half the people thinking that. You can see that near other major urban areas, no one thinks that they are talking about New York City. In the upper left-hand map, the people next to New York City believe that you're talking about New York City. In the lower left-hand map, only the people right next to Chicago think that Chicago is the city. In the lower right-hand map, only people who live right next to Boston think you mean Boston. And in the upper right-hand map marked Other, you can see that there are areas around each of the major cities where people agree on which city the city is. Notice that San Francisco didn't even rate a listing other than other, despite the fact that we've got the largest red splotch out of any of these maps.
So where do you suppose the researchers for this study were from? My guess is that most of them were from Chicago and Boston, which is why they included their cities in these maps, even though almost nobody in the country thinks of their cities as being the city. Now, for my favorite map from this study, since my response to this was, this exists? What do you call a drive-through liquor store? You can see that in this case, the names align with state borders because legislation is going to designate whether a drive through liquor store is something that's even legal at all. They are not legal in California, Nevada, Washington, and many of the western states. So you can see that people in those areas are marked in red for, I have never heard of such a thing. The blue areas indicate, we have these in my area but have no special term for them. The green is other, but my favorite, that yellow area over on the side, is a brew-through. A drive through liquor store is a brew-through. So, the government can affect dialect. Locations, like how close to a city, can affect it. And just odd changes that happen, like with sodas and crawdads. Now that you have seen how language is not one single thing, but a collection of dialects that differ in many ways, big and small, let's talk about a misconception that's hard to avoid. Now, despite what you may have been told, no dialect is intrinsically better than any other dialect. It's like if you're looking at a bunch of different breeds of dogs. The German Shepherd and the Poodle look very different from each other, but they're both dogs. One isn't a bad or corrupted version of the other. In actual fact, people's sense of what a language should sound like, or how it should be used, is more a matter of fashion than logic, just as many people's preference for one type of dog over another is a matter of personal taste, not some intrinsic value difference between the breeds. Even if you think of dialects as being either standard English or non-standard English, Non-standard doesn't mean substandard, though it is often perceived that way, particularly due to the value placed on mastering standard English in academic and professional life. Languages are actually bundles of equally valid dialects, of which the standard in any given language is just a dialect that, in some sense, got lucky. All the dialects of a language develop from the same ancestor. For example, at one point, Latin was diverging in different parts of the Roman Empire. A writer in 63 AD lamented that there was one dialect in what was today France, another in Italy, and another in Spain. He said, quote, It has gotten to the point that the student of Latin is writing in what is to them an artificial language, end quote. Writers at the time lamented how horrible and incomprehensible Latin was becoming outside of Rome. Eventually, over time, they diverged so far that they became separate languages altogether, modern-day French, Italian, Spanish, and the other Romance languages. We don't think that one of these languages is better than another, or that they are somehow bad Latin, even though they all started out as Latin. Each is just its own language. Similarly, all dialects are equally valid variations of a language arising from geographic or cultural difference or isolation. One way to think of dialects is as branches of a single previous language that are on the way to becoming new languages but have only progressed part of the way. Americans, Scottish people, Australians, and people from England are all speaking in dialects that developed from Middle English, but each developed in different ways, and all are equally valid to their speakers. If global communication and writing weren't such strong influences in the modern world, each of these would continue to diverge until they were all different languages, as happened to French and Spanish from the original Latin. Now then, we have talked about how you are actually an expert in your native language, but the dialect you speak is slightly different from standard English taught in schools. The question then is, why did standard English get picked, and not the way that I speak? Well, the answer is simple and unpredictable. The answer is, it got lucky.
Languages gradually changing over time is a natural trend throughout history. However, particularly once literacy becomes widely taught, writing standardizes language. When writing begins to be standardized, the question becomes which dialect or way of speaking is going to be the one preserved and used. Which dialect will be taught in schools and used in formal and public situations? Usually, the dialect that is chosen is picked because it has some kind of prominence or social prestige. For example, in Italian, the type that is the standard today, and the one you learned if you took Italian in school, is the Tuscan dialect used by Dante, who wrote Dante's Inferno, and a few other famous writers, which then became seen as the language of culture, what people now think of as real Italian, despite the fact that there were plenty of other dialects to choose from, such as Sicilian or the dialect spoken near Naples that's used in much of Italian music today. So really, it's a matter of geopolitics. Whatever area is most highly regarded or most powerful will likely end up imposing its dialect on the rest of the country, not because it's better, but because it has more power. The same thing applies to English as well. The standard English we speak now just happened to be the dialect spoken by the upper classes in London, which ended up having a certain prestige or authority due to the fact that London was a center of political power. The royal court had been established there since before 1000 AD, and it was where the universities were founded. The dialect the professors spoke ended up seeming like how educated people talk, or later, the right way to talk. But if universities had happened to become established in a different part of England, we would talk and write completely differently. Before the standardization, there were lots of different dialects, each of which was considered to be the right way of speaking by the people who spoke it. This patchwork of dialects is clearly illustrated by one of the earliest printers in England, William Caxton. You can see one page of his printed story about dialects here on the screen. Unusually for the time, he chose to do most of his printing in the local vernacular, English. Most books at the time were published in Latin, as most people could read Latin in addition to their native language. Caxton printed in the mid to late 1400s, and he wrote in the preface of one of his books that it was difficult to know in which dialect to publish books. In Caxton's times, there were five main dialects of English, each based on one region of England, and many more minor variations of those main five. To illustrate the difficulties, Caxton tells a story about a Londoner, who speaks the East Midland dialect of English, getting shipwrecked in Kent, which is only about 40 miles away, but where the Kentish dialect was spoken, and stops by a house to get some food. However, after listening to his request for eggs, the woman, called a good wife in the story, said that she was sorry, but that she didn't speak any French. Caxton tells us that the Londoner was angry because he didn't speak French either, but their dialects were so different she couldn't understand him. London's words for eggs was egges, whereas in Kent they were called iren. This also illustrates how the London dialect is what has come down to us today, with the others virtually disappearing. You've likely never heard of iren, but you can see how egges became eggs over time. I couldn't resist this memification of the ancient story when I came across it in my search for illustrations for this slide. In it, you can see the good wife hearing the word egges and wondering if it's French. The meme uses Caxton's original spellings. Contributing to this problem of understanding was the common practice in those days of printing in Latin, which, being a dead language, didn't change or have divergent dialects. There was only one kind of Latin left, the prestige dialect used in ancient literature. In England, France, Spain, and most other European countries at that time, nearly all literature was written in Latin, not the local language in part to avoid having to choose between the wide range of regional dialects, and in part because that gave them an international market, since books tended to be hideously expensive. So then, 
What is today standard English became the standard via chance influences, not inherent worth or quality. It became the language, with other dialects dying out or becoming more similar to it as it spread via increased literacy and education. But the choice of the London dialect for the standard was not due to any inherent superiority. However, when a country begins to establish itself and gain a national identity, there are many reasons to create a single standard for the language of that country. So then, how do we pick the one that everyone is going to write in? And what makes the one that's been chosen, called standard English, better than how you talk to your friends? In short, it isn't. But long ago, scholars agreed on that one, and since writing a language tends to slow down the language change, we have features of written standard English that have fallen out of use in most spoken English, such as the use of whom. So, you know that you are an expert in your own language, but that there are lots of different dialects. The one that we all learn in school today just got lucky. Now, it's time to move on to the last point that I want to make in order to help you see grammar as less intimidating. Parts of it don't even make sense. Let's see how and why. In fact, one of the reasons that formal written language can be so different than what we speak has to do with the effects of writing. Once language is regularly written down and literacy is widespread, then language change tends to slow down or even freeze to a large extent. We can see the evidence of this in the fact that Shakespeare, who died in 1616, would have found Beowulf, written around 1000, incomprehensible, and yet we can puzzle through Shakespeare, even though there are about the same number of centuries between us and Shakespeare as between Shakespeare and the unknown author of Beowulf. The larger differences can be seen to the casual observer. The one on the left looks a bit funny, with things that look like an F where they mean an S and some archaic spelling, like the two L's in comical, and a bit of older vocabulary. No one has said forsooth in a long time. However, the one on the right is completely indecipherable. And when we type out the first line of each, the differences in the rate of change are even clearer. While we can connect the modern translation of Shakespeare's first line of The Merchant of Venice to what he originally wrote, even when we're given the translation for Beowulf, you still can't understand the original. This difference in the rate of change of the English language is due to writing's increasing role in the English language from the year 1500 to the present, versus the lack of widespread literacy from the years 1000 A.D. to 1500 A.D. So then, one effect of widespread literacy is that spelling begins to be taught, and thus becomes frozen, even though pronunciation continues to undergo the organic changes that are natural to any language. Notice that in spoken English, you say veg to bowls, or even veggies, leaving out the middle e, not veg e to bowls. And other words have changed their spoken pronunciation as well. For instance, many people say gonna instead of the older version preserved in spelling, going to. There was even an event called the Great Vowel Shift that took place between 1400 and 1700 when all Middle English long vowels changed their pronunciation and many consonants became silent. Because English spelling was becoming standardized around the same time, the Great Vowel Shift is responsible for many of the peculiarities of English spelling, where the spelling doesn't match the pronunciation. Fascinatingly, no one knows why this shift has happened, and it's been the source of intense scholarly debate. I encourage you to Google it if you're interested in learning more about it. Nor is that enough division between spelling and pronunciation. Sometimes, spelling is even based on what people thought things should be. For example, there was an era when everyone idolized Latin and thought of it as the best language and what a language should be due in part to its antiquity and the number of great works that were written in it, as well as the fact that much of the serious literature and scholarship was conducted in Latin long after it was a dead language. 
At that time, many words were changed to make them seem more Latin. For instance, it was during that time that a B got added to doubt because it was descended from the Latin word dubitare, even though the Middle English version of the word, doubtin, had neither a B nor a B sound. As mentioned in the chapter, descriptive approaches to language simply record how it's used, whereas prescriptive approaches try to create a dialect, or just rules, to be used in formal situations. Descriptivists assume that people who speak the language know how to do it correctly, and they try and figure out the underlying system. Prescriptivists assume that they know better than anyone else what it should be like, and enthusiastically try to convince everyone that anyone who doesn't talk their way is doing it wrong. One discovered the underlying system, the other imposes their own. An example of a descriptive linguist would be the one who divided out letters into vowels and consonants. Vowels are said with no stoppage anywhere in your vocal tract. Think of them as airy. Consonants, on the other hand, have a restriction or closure at some point in the vocal tract. The prescriptivists had particular influence in the 17 to 1800s when English was being standardized, and many of their ideas have hung on through today. One of the outdated ideals that still influences how English is taught today is the reverence in which Latin was held. Due to its complicated nature, antiquity, and the number of classical works written in it, as well as its re-emerging place as the language of education for hundreds of years beginning in the Renaissance, Latin was seen as the best language for much of Europe's history. This fetish for Latin as a language somehow better than English has had a lot of effects. For instance, many grammatical rules taught in schools today were actually made up by Robert Loth in his book, A Short Introduction to English Grammar, first published in 1762. He felt English needed to be fancied up in order to be taken seriously and to be on par with Latin. Two instances of grammatical rules that are the most controversial and annoying today were both handed down to us by Loth. One is ending a sentence with a preposition, and the other is the use of whom as the object form of who, i.e., for whom are you looking, versus who are you looking for. In Loth's time, both ending a sentence with a preposition and using who instead of whom happened all the time. People did it and thought nothing of it. But Loth felt that English should be more like Latin, and in Latin, you can't have a preposition at the end. It just doesn't go there. It would be like saying, I saw boy the. You just couldn't do it. It didn't work. But English isn't Latin, as you may have noticed. Unfortunately for us, Loth thought it should be, so he just transposed the rule about prepositions over to English. However, it seems to me that it's counterproductive to try and force this rule that never even made sense in the first place on people 300 years later. So, you'll notice that in my textbook, I have a more informal type of writing that does often end a sentence with a preposition. That increasing informality is a way that English has been changing, particularly over the last 20 or 30 years. English has become more informal. The word whom is also an interesting case. People see the use of whom as a marker of education, but really it is a sort of historical curiosity that doesn't really make sense in modern English, because for one thing, we don't need it for our sentences to be clearly understood. So a lot of what grammar is ends up being how much of the discourse community thinks you have to use certain conventions in order to be respected or taken seriously. It's not a matter of intrinsic correctness or incorrectness, but rather agreed-upon conventions that change over time. Nonetheless, with that said, it is important to learn these conventions so that you can choose to use them or not use them consciously, thinking of their utility as well as the effect that your decision will have on the perception of you and your writing by your reader.
Interestingly, at the time that Loth was writing, whom was rarely used and was on its way to disappearing completely. Loth specifically criticized his contemporary, Jonathan Swift, author of Gulliver's Travels and a Modest Proposal, for not using it. So people who were esteemed writers at the time and are still famous hundreds of years later weren't using it. But Loth didn't like that, so here we are, nearly 300 years later, still dealing with his opinions and the effects his obsession with Latin had. The guy wasn't even a linguist. He was a bishop. Clearly, the rules are not based in logic. It's not that we shouldn't be concerned with the elegance of language or clarity or effectness of communication, but it is good to be aware of the arbitrariness and senselessness of some of these rules, particularly when so often people are made to feel inferior due to the way that they speak. In reality, it's more about personal preference than actual correctness. Languages are idiosyncratic and eccentric, naturally. Another point I want to make is about how we see writing. In modern times, we often think that writing is merely speech recorded, which isn't really accurate, and can inhibit mastery of formal writing's conventions. For almost the entire history of writing, you didn't just scrawl out a shopping list or jot down a quick note. Writing was something that was done only by a select few and was regarded extremely seriously. It was used almost exclusively for religious purposes, highly formal record-keeping, and high literature. Written documents were treasured and sweated over. This meant that you usually didn't write the way people around you actually spoke. You wanted to write better than that, which resulted in people writing either in a highly fossilized version of the language or even in another better language, such as Latin or, in Norman England, French. You didn't write casually. You wrote to exhibit your education while recording important events, sharing serious important discussions, or crafting highly artistic works of linguistic skill. Nowadays, you're much more likely to write things down casually and quickly for your own use and not as a way of showing off your education. We are much more practical in our approach. Although the divide between writing and speaking is no longer quite as extreme as it used to be, we don't write in an entirely different language, we still don't write the same way that we speak. For instance, we don't write vegetables even though that is how we say it, without that E between veg and tables, nor would we write gonna in an educational or professional setting despite the fact that it is commonly pronounced that way, even by highly educated individuals. Instead, we learn the conventions of a somewhat fossilized, more formal version of our language that we call Standard English, even though it isn't how we tend to speak, send texts, or jot notes. It is the standard for formal writing and a way of displaying education, despite its lack of correspondence with how language is used orally. Just as there are times when it's appropriate to lay around comfortably in your sweats, there are also times when it's appropriate to dress in less comfortable, fancier clothing, particularly when you want to make a good impression, such as at a job interview. In the same way, your natural, unconscious speech patterns are perfectly appropriate in many situations, but should be adjusted to a more artificial and cleaned-up version in others, particularly when you want to be perceived as educated and intelligent. With that in mind, the next video will look at grammatical categories and how you can use them to enhance your understanding and use of that odd dialect, standard English, that can have such an effect on how others perceive not only your level of education, but even your intelligence and worth, however unjust that can be. It's not fair or right, but it is the way the world works, and thus it is worth it to take the time to master this fossilized, formal dialect. Thank you for watching. I hope that this overview was helpful and illuminating. Please don't hesitate to contact me with any questions you may have about the material. I am always happy to help. I look forward to joining you for another video lecture next time.